Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money. A Wells Fargo CD account. Where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Hello, saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. This is Space Time Series 23, Episode 43, for broadcast on the 8th of May, 2020. Coming up on Space Time. Three companies selected to develop lunar module concepts for NASA's Artemis mission to return people to the moon. The U.S. Navy releases its UFO videos. And the Eta Ackward's meteor shower, generated by Halley's Comet, one of the highlights of May on Skywatch. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA has selected SpaceX, Blue Origin and Dianetics to further develop their concepts for the next generation of Lunar Module. The new Artemis human landing system will see Americans back on the surface of the Moon in four years' time, 52 years since the crew of Apollo 17 became the last humans to leave footprints on the lunar surface. Blue Origins will push forward with development of their integrated lunar vehicle concept, a three-stage lander with separate descent, ascent and transfer stages. It'll be launched from Earth aboard either the new United Launch Alliance Vulcan launch system or Blue Origins' own new launch system known as New Glenn. Meanwhile, Dianetics are developing a low-slowing human landing system which incorporates both descent and ascent capabilities in the one vehicle. It'll be launched to the Moon aboard a United Launch Alliance Vulcan rocket. And then there's SpaceX, who plan on using their new Starship Super Heavy Lift launch system, which is already fairly advanced in its development. Originally called the BFR, which we're told stands for Big Falcon Rocket, Starship is the culmination of Elon Musk's dream to develop a fully reusable Super Heavy Lift launch system capable of carrying up to 150 tonnes into low Earth orbit or 100 tonnes on missions to the Moon, Mars or other interplanetary journeys across the solar system. Musk sees Starship very much as a colonial transport system, a way to actually begin colonies on other worlds. Technically, Starship is the upper stage of what is a two-stage launch system. The 230-ton first stage, known as Super Heavy, is 68 metres long, 9 metres in diameter, and constructed out of stainless steel. It'll be powered by 37 liquid methane and oxygen-propelled Raptor rocket engines, providing 72 meganewtons or 16 million pounds of thrust. The 120-ton upper or Starship stage will be 50 metres long, also 9 metres wide and constructed out of stainless steel, and powered by six liquid methane oxygen propellant Raptor engines, three for atmospheric flight and three for vacuum, delivering approximately 12,000 kilonewtons or 2,600,000 pounds of thrust. And it'll also be equipped with its own retractable landing gear, allowing it to undertake rocket-assisted vertical landings, as we're already seeing with the Falcon 9. Both refueling tankers and satellite payload delivery upper stage versions will also be produced. SpaceX plans on using the Starship Super Heavy launch system to replace the company's existing Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy launch systems, as well as its Dragon capsules during the early 2020s. The three companies will now need to refine their lander concepts by February next year, including initial demonstration missions. NASA will then move forward selecting viable landing systems for use by the astronauts during the Artemis III mission to the lunar surface. That flight will launch the new Orion capsule containing a crew of four aboard NASA's new SLS rocket. Orion will travel to the new Lunar Gateway space station, which will be positioned in translunar orbit, where two crew members will transfer to the lunar lander for the final leg of their journey to the moon's south pole. This report from NASA TV. Apollo led the way to the moon. And we, 
the Artemis generation are going there to stay. Those of us in blue flight suits, the start of the Artemis generation of astronauts, could not be more excited about contributing to our nation's goal of putting the first woman and the next man on the lunar surface by 2024. We, NASA, have been partnering with U.S. industry in order to achieve the best of what each organization bring. So without further ado, the companies are SpaceX. The SpaceX design is a single stage solution using their Starship. The SpaceX proposal included in space propellant transfer demonstration and uncrewed test landing. The second company is Dynetics. And Dynetics has many partners that they will be working with. It also has a very unique low slung crew module, putting the crew very close to the lunar surface for transfer and access. Dynetics will perform a demonstration flight to verify key capabilities for its lander system. And the third team is the national team with Blue Origin as the prime. The team's design is a three-stage architecture consisting of an ascent, descent, and transfer elements. With this diverse set of architectures, NASA is confident in our nation's ability to perform the Artemis missions. The landing on the moon in 2024 will be the most dangerous and complex flying task attempted by humans in more than 50 years. And it's only been done six times ever. That's why we're so excited about how to learn how to fly these landers so we can make that smooth touchdown on the lunar surface and do what we came for lunar surface exploration. And that report from NASA TV featured NASA astronaut Randy Bresnik and NASA Human Landing Systems Program Manager Lisa Watson Morgan. This is Space Time. Still to come, the US Navy releases its latest UFO videos and the Eta Ackroyd's meteor shower generated by Halley's Comet, one of the highlights of May Skywatch. All that and more still to come on Space Time. The U.S. Department of Defense has now formally released those three Navy videos showing encounters between F-18 Super Hornet fighter jets and a series of unexplained aerial phenomena. Navy speak for what most people call UFOs. There's still no explanation for exactly what these UFOs were. Although, as I said last year when we covered the story, my money's still on a new generation of advanced autonomous military drones. The three videos, simply known as Gimbal, Floor 1 and Go Fast, were taken by Rathion Advance targeting forward-looking infrared pods mounted under the wings of the F-18s. The 2004 Gimbal footage involved the sighting of an object which the pilots described as some new kind of drone. Hey, that is a drone, bro. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. Oh my gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Oh, that thing, dude. That's not an LNS, though, is it? It's not. That is an LNS, dude. Well, if there's a like that thing, it's rotated. The second video, known as Fleur 1, was recorded in November 2004. It involved an encounter between a pair of hornets from the USS Nimitz off the coast of San Diego and shows an oblong-shaped object which accelerates out of view from sensors at very high speed. The story actually begins with a Ticonderoga-class guided missile cruiser USS Princeton which detected a series of intermittent radar tracks. A few days later, the Princeton reported 5 to 10 similar radar traces and the aircraft carrier USS Nimitz ordered a pair of FA-18s to check it out. Now, according to the pilots, the object first appeared dropping from about 80,000 feet down to a hover just 50 feet above the ocean, causing the water beneath it to appear to boil. And then it rapidly climbed again to about 12,000 feet before accelerating away at supersonic speeds. The pilots described the object as being bright white and shaped like a tic-tac, about 14 meters long, without any wings, no exhaust and no discernible propulsion system. A short time later, the Princeton told the FA-18 pilots the radar track had now been detected 100 kilometers away, but it disappeared long before the Hornets reached that location. Now, if the radar tracks are both from the same object, it means the UFO was traveling at over 68,000 kilometers per hour. The third video, known as Go Fast, shows an incident that occurred off the east coast of the United States in 2015 involving FA-18 Hornets from the aircraft carrier USS Theodore Roosevelt. 
The UFOs in this incident are described as having no distinct wings, no distinct tail, no distinct exhaust plumes, and looking like a sphere encasing a cube. No, I took an auto train. Oh, okay. Oh my gosh, dude. Wow, look at that, Look at the The objects were showing up at 30,000 feet as well as at sea level and could accelerate, slow down and hit hypersonic speeds with manoeuvres far beyond the physical limits of any human crew. The consensus among the pilots was that these UFOs were some new kind of drones. For its part, the US Navy insists they have no idea what the UFOs, uh, unexplained aerial phenomena that is, really are. So, I guess, the mystery continues. This is space time. Still to come, a Russian Progress cargo ship docked successfully with the International Space Station following a rapid rendezvous to orbit three-hour flight. And the Etikarina meteor shower generated by Halley's Comet, one of the highlights of Skywatch in May. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Okay, let's take a break from our show for a word from our sponsor, ExpressVPN, rated number one by TechRadar. You may be wondering why you need a virtual private network. Well, it's in the name. It's all about privacy. Do you really want big brother tech companies, hackers, governments, and who knows who else snooping in on your online activities? Now, you might not have anything to hide, but it's still really creepy, and it could be dangerous for you and those you care about. Also, how often do you run across a website and you want to get information from it, but you find out that they're geo-blocked? It's all very frustrating, and it's becoming an increasing problem. And that's where ExpressVPN can help you. ExpressVPN's a simple and efficient way to protect your online privacy. It's internet without borders from the world's leading VPN provider. So, protect your online privacy today. And find out how you can get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's tryexpressvpn.com slash space for three months free with a one-year package. Visit tryexpressvpn.com slash space to learn more. And of course, you'll find the link details in the show notes and on our website. That's tryexpressvpn.com slash space. And now, it's back to our show. You're listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A Russian Progress cargo ship has successfully docked with the International Space Station following a fast two-orbit rendezvous flight. The Progress 75, carrying almost three tons of food, fuel, water, medical supplies and other equipment, had launched just three hours earlier aboard a Soyuz rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan. The uh, Soyuz 2.1A booster and its uh, Progress uh, resupply ship encapsulated in its upper stage rolled out uh, to the launch pad a short distance uh, on Wednesday morning, uh, just after 7 a.m. Uh, Baikonur time. On the uh, upper stage of the uh, Soyuz booster, uh, the Logo 75th, uh, that uh, is representative of the fact that this launch of the 75th Progress is coming on the 75th anniversary of the day that Soviet and American troops met at the Elbe River near Torgau in Germany, marking an important step toward the end of World War II in Europe. Marking that moment in history, the Soyuz booster is decorated today with memorial logos as it sits on the launch pad fully fueled at Site 31 Roscosmos. The Russian Federal Space Agency is calling this vehicle the Victory Rocket. And the first of uh, the umbilicals now retracting. Once the uh, second umbilical retracts, that will initiate the uh, launch command for main engine start. There goes the second umbilical. We have a go for main engine start. We have main engine start. Turbo pumps now coming up to flight speed and liftoff. Liftoff of the 75th Progress resupply ship on a fast track two orbit flight to the International Space Station. Roll, pitch, and yaw program are in. The Soyuz 2.1A booster arcing out to the northeast from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. 
All parameters are reported to be normal. The International Space Station is now flying directly over the Baikonur Cosmodrome. The uh, Soyuz uh, now moving through the period of uh, maximum dynamic pressure, going supersonic as it heads downrange. Soyuz traveling at uh, 2,500 miles an hour, some 15 miles in altitude now, 10 miles downrange from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. All parameters are reported to be normal by the engineers of the blockhouse in Baikonur as we stand by for first stage shutdown and separation. And we have first stage shutdown. Second stage engines up and running in good shape. The flight is reported to be proceeding in nominal fashion. Good structural parameters being reported. The Soyuz uh, second stage is guiding uh, the Progress resupply ship on a precise path to its preliminary orbit. And we uh, have reports of launch shroud jettison. All the vehicle uh, parameters are in good shape, good engine performance from the second stage engines. And we have third stage shutdown, and all of uh, the appendages have now been deployed, the solar rays and the navigational antenna and the TV boom on the progress. A perfect launch and a perfect ride to its preliminary orbit. Launch occurring at 8.51 and 41 seconds p.m. Central Time. The progress docked with the space station is both spacecraft flying at 28,000 kilometers per hour, some 419 kilometers above northwestern China. The Progress 75 will remain docked to the orbiting outpost for more than seven months, before departing in December to deorbit and burn up in Earth's atmosphere. This is Space Time. And time now to turn our eyes once again to the skies and check out the celestial sphere for the month of May on Skywatch. May is the fifth month of the year in both the Julian and Gregorian calendars. The month was named after the Greek goddess Maya, who was identified with the Roman era goddess of fertility Bonadea, whose festival was held in May. More importantly for many of our listeners, May typically marks the start of summer vacation season in the United States and Canada. Although I guess things are a little bit different this year with the coronavirus lockdown. Anyway, being stuck at home is a great time to look at the skies, so let's start our night tour by looking to the east where you'll find the constellation Scorpius the Scorpion. In Greek mythology, the constellation Scorpius the Scorpion is named after Scorpius who was sent by the earth goddess Gaia to slay Orion the Hunter after he boasted that he could kill all the animals on earth. Scorpius stung Orion in the shoulder. But Orion's life was then spared by Ophiuchus the healer, and he was placed in the heavens along with Scorpius, who would continue to pursue him across the skies for eternity. Orion the hunter became the hunted forever, with Scorpius rising in the east this time of year to triumphantly chase and defeat Orion, who then sets in the west. Meanwhile, Ophiuchus the healer rises in the east, following right behind Scorpius, to crush him to the earth, as the scorpion sets in the west. And so this story plays out year after year. Now, interestingly, some parts of this story predate the Greeks, with Orion known in ancient Egypt as Osiris, the Egyptian god of the underworld and of regeneration. The bright star in Scorpius, Alpha Scorpii or Antares, marks the scorpion's heart. In ancient Greek, Antares means the equal or rival of Mars, the god of war. That's because its golden orange appearance is very similar to that of the red planet and it passes very close to Mars every 780 days. Seen easily with the unaided eye, Antares is actually some 550 light years away. But it looks so bright because it's one of the largest known stars in the universe. It's a red supergiant, some 57,500 times as luminous as the Sun, around 18 times the Sun's mass, and some 883 times the Sun's diameter. Were it placed where the Sun is in our solar system, it would engulf all the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, and its visible surface would extend almost as far out as the orbit of Jupiter. Astronomers think Antares began its life around 12 million years ago as a spectral type O or B blue star. Astronomers describe stars in terms of spectral types, a classification system based on temperature and characteristics. The hottest, most massive and most luminous stars are known as spectral type O blue stars. They're followed by spectral type B blue stars, spectral type A white stars, spectral type F whitish yellow stars, spectral type G yellow stars, that's where our sun is by the way, spectral type K orange stars, and the coolest and least massive stars known are spectral type M red stars. 
Now, each spectral classification system can also be subdivided using a numeric digit to represent temperature, with zero being the hottest and nine being the coolest, and then a Roman numeral to represent luminosity. So putting all that together, our Sun is officially classified as a G25 yellow dwarf star. Now also included in the stellar classification system are spectral types L, T and Y, which are assigned to failed stars known as brown dwarves, some of which were born as spectral type M red stars and became brown dwarves after losing some of their mass. Brown dwarves fit into a category between the largest planets, which are about 13 times the mass of Jupiter, and the smallest spectral type M red dwarf stars which are around 75 to 80 times the mass of Jupiter, or if you prefer, 0.08 solar masses. Like the similarly sized red giant Betelgeuse in the constellation Orion, Antares will almost certainly end its life as a spectacular Type II or core collapse supernova, probably within the next 100,000 years or so. When it does explode, it'll appear as bright as the full moon for several months on end, and should be clearly visible in daylight from here on Earth. Antares has a companion star in Antares B, and the two stars orbit each other at an average distance of around 224 astronomical units. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, which equates to about 150 million kilometres, or 8.3 light minutes. Spectral analysis of Antares B shows it's pulling a lot of material off its bloated red supergiant companion. Located near Antares is the M4 globular cluster. Globular clusters are tight balls densely packed with thousands of stars, which were all originally formed at the same time in the collapse of the same molecular gas and dust cloud. They're all usually fairly ancient, as old as some galaxies, dating back around 12 billion years. M4 is composed of about a million or so stars. Easily seen through a small pair of binoculars, the M4 globular cluster is located around 7,200 light years away, making it one of the nearest globular clusters to Earth. A light year is about 10 trillion kilometres. The distance a photon can travel in a year at the speed of light, which is about 300,000 kilometres per second in a vacuum, and the ultimate speed limit of the universe. Located near the tail of the Scorpion are two open star clusters known as M6 and M7. Open star clusters are loosely bound groups of a few thousand stars, which were also all originally formed in the same molecular gas and dust clouds, but they're not as densely bound as globular clusters. Open clusters generally survive for only a few hundred million years, with the most massive ones surviving for maybe a few billion years. That's in contrast to the more massive globular clusters, which exert far stronger gravitational attraction on their members and can therefore survive as single bodies much longer. M6, which is also known as the butterfly cluster, is some 12 light years across and located about 1600 light years away. It contains around 80 stars, all of which are less than 100 million years old, making them fairly young in cosmic terms. Now the other star cluster is M7, the Ptolemy Cluster. It's named after the Greek astronomer and mathematician Claudius Ptolemy. It's about 980 light years away, and is far more dispersed than M6, covering an area of around 25 light years. And at an estimated age of 200 million years, M7 is about twice as old as M6. By the way, the M in terms like M7, M6 or even M4 are all abbreviations for Messier in honour of the 18th century French astronomer Charles Messier who developed an astronomical catalogue of fuzzy nebula objects in the skies. See, Messier was a comet hunter who compiled a list of 103 fuzzy objects which weren't comets and so from his perspective could be ignored. Later, other astronomers added additional celestial objects to the catalogue bringing the present list up to 110. Our solar system, and for that matter most of the stars we can see when we look up at night, are all located in the Milky Way's Orion Arm. The Orion Arm, or Orion Spur, or sometimes even Orion Cygnus Arm, depending on which name you prefer, is around 3,500 light years wide and about 10,000 light years long. The Orion Arm is named after the Orion Constellation, one of the most prominent constellations in the Southern Hemisphere summer and Northern Hemisphere winter skies. Some of the brightest and most famous objects in the constellation include Betelgeuse, Rigel, the stars of Orion's Belt, and the Orion Nebula, all of which are located within the Orion Arm. The Orion Arm is located between the Carina Sagittarius Arm, which is more towards the galactic centre from where we are, and the Perseus Arm, which is more towards the outer edge of the galaxy from our viewpoint. The Perseus Arm is also one of the two major arms that make up the Milky Way, the other being the Sanctum Centaurus Arm. Long thought of as nothing more than a minor structure or spur between the two longer adjacent arms, Perseus and Carina Sagittarius, 
Evidence was presented in 2013 that it might actually be a branch of the Perseus arm, or possibly even an independent arm segment in itself. Within the Orion arm, our solar system, including the Earth, are located close to the inner rim of what's known as the local bubble, about halfway along the Orion arm's length, approximately 27,000 light years from the galactic centre. This local bubble is a cavity in the interstellar medium of the Orion arm, containing among other things the local interstellar cloud, which contains our solar system, and also the G cloud. It's at least 300 light years across, and has a neutral hydrogen density of about 0.05 atoms per cubic centimetre. That's about a tenth the average for the interstellar medium in the Milky Way, and about a sixth that of the local interstellar cloud. The hot diffuse gases in the local bubble emit X-rays, and are the result of a supernova that exploded within the past 10 to 20 million years. It was once thought that the most likely candidate for the remains of this supernova was Geminga, a pulsar in the constellation Gemini. Later, however, it was suggested that multiple supernovae in subgroup B1 of the Pleiades moving group were more likely responsible, becoming a remnant supershell. Our solar system has been travelling through this region, currently occupied by the local bubble, for the last 5 to 10 million years. Our current location is in the local interstellar cloud, a minor region of denser material within the bubble. This cloud formed where the local bubble and another bubble called the Loop 1 bubble meet. The gas within the local interstellar cloud has a density of around 0.3 atoms per cubic centimetre. The local bubble isn't spherical, but it seems to be narrower in the galactic plane, becoming somewhat egg-shaped or elliptical, and may widen above and below the galactic plane, becoming more like an hourglass. Now, as I said earlier, it abuts bubbles of less dense interstellar medium, including the Loop 1 bubble. Now, as for that other bubble we mentioned, the Loop 1 bubble, well, it was created by supernovae and stellar winds from the Scorpius and Taurus Association some 500 light years away. And the Loop 1 bubble contains the star Antares, which we talked about at the start of tonight's Skywatch. Several tunnels, known collectively as the Lupus Tunnels, connect the cavities of the local bubble and the Loop 1 bubble. Other bubbles adjacent to our local bubble are the Loop 2 bubble and the Loop 3 bubble. Now also visible this month is the Eta Acarids meteor shower, which is generated as the Earth passes through the dust and debris trail left behind by Halley's Comet. Comet P1 Halley is a well-known short-period comet which visits the inner solar system every 75 to 76 years. This 15-kilometre wide mountain of rock and ice will make its next close-up appearance in 2061. It's named in honour of the British astronomer Edmund Halley, who in 1705, after examining ancient Chinese, Babylonian and medieval European records, successfully predicted its return in 1758. Sadly, however, he died in 1742, before his prediction could be confirmed. The comet's highly elliptical and elongated orbit takes it from somewhere between the orbits of Mercury and Venus out to almost as far as the orbit of Pluto. Halley's Comet is retrograde, meaning it orbits the Sun in the opposite direction of the planets, that is, clockwise when viewed from above the Sun's north pole. Its retrograde orbit means it has one of the highest velocities relative to the Earth of any object in our solar system travelling at some 70.56 kilometres per second, or if you prefer, 254,016 kilometres per hour. As well as the Eta Acarids meteor shower every May, Halley's Comet also produces the Orionids meteor shower in late October. Astronomers think Halley's was originally a long-period comet, which took thousands of years to travel to the inner solar system from the Oort cloud, but was gravitationally perturbed into its current orbit through a series of close encounters with the giant outer planets. The Eta Acarids meteor shower runs from the 19th of April through the 28th of May, with around 55 meteors an hour, making it one of the Southern Hemisphere's best celestial showers. However, back in 1975, they were running 95 meteors an hour, and in 1980 it was up to 110. Even better, the bright yellow meteors often appear as streaks, which are known as trains. They all radiate out from the direction of the constellation Aquarius and the star Eta Acari, hence the shower's name, Eta Acarids. Just look towards the east after midnight and before dawn for the best view. Jonathan Nally, editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, joins us now for the rest of our tour of the night skies in May on Skywatch. For those of us in the Southern Hemisphere, we're definitely heading into winter, anyone can tell. If you live down here in the South, the sun's setting much earlier, of course. Nights are getting longer and colder. 
But this is actually really good stargazing time because because the nights are longer, you've got more hours of darkness to uh, get out there out there and do your stargazing. Does the cold make the night air stiller and therefore better for sky watching? I don't know that the, the cold air makes the night stiller necessarily. It's certainly true that you do get cold still nights, but the, the quality of seeing, as astronomers call it, they call it yeah. seeing, is really determined by the amount of move, uh, wind. But it's generally wind in the upper atmosphere, not um, not. Lower down. Ah, right, right. Uh, it's because it's, you're looking through 100 kilometres or more than hundreds, hundreds of kilometres. If you're looking sort of not not directly overhead, but more down towards the horizon, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kilometres of air. So um, there's a, there is a lot of potential from between you and where space is for there to be lots of air currents through there and it's usually mm-hmm. the ones uh, up high uh, because air currents up high are quite fast mm-hmm. so um, that's what it is so really good constellation visible such as the Southern Cross the one everyone wants to see which in the middle part of the evening during May is standing upright standing right upright high in the south you can't miss it small crucifix looking constellation with nice bright stars to its left are the two brightest stars in the constellation Centaurus astronomers call them the two pointers because they're the ones that point towards the Southern Cross to the right of the Southern Cross you've got the constellations Carina Vela and Puppis, which are all full of wonderful star fields and nebulae. Honestly, you can pick out quite a few of these star fields and nebulae just with the uh, just with binoculars. But if you do have a telescope, even a small one, you get a much much better view, and you can see stacks of stars and things. It's really wonderful. See if you can find the star cluster called Omega Centauri. It's a globular star cluster. It looks like a like a little ball of stars basically. And there's a galaxy called NGC 5128. And both of these are not too far from the Southern Cross. You can you can actually spot them dimly with the naked eye if you're in dark sky but you can't really see what they are if you've got little telescope you'll get a really good view now over in the west after the sun has set you'll see uh, the constellation orion still there orion the hunter but it's setting now so it's just about to disappear from our night skies for this season nearby is sirius the brightest star in the night sky we talk about it a lot it's also the brightest star in the constellation canis major or the greater dog is what that means canis major a little bit to the north is another fairly bright star and this is called procyon which is the brightest star in the constellation canis minor the lesser dog so there are a couple of woofers up there (laughs) in the northern half of the sky it doesn't seem to be as many bright star fields this time of year um, compared to down the southern part of the sky. But there are some famous constellations there, such as Leo and Cancer and Virgo. Uh, Astronomers really like Virgo because it contains hundreds and hundreds of galaxies, but you do need a telescope to see them. Over in the eastern part of the sky, uh, after it's got dark, you'll see the constellation Scorpius beginning to poke its tail above the horizon. As the night progresses, you'll see the full constellation become visible. It's really quite specky. It's one of those constellations that actually looks like what it's meant to, this big scorpion shape. And it's followed a little bit later in the night by Sagittarius. Sagittarius doesn't really look like anything, but when you do look towards Sagittarius, you are looking in the direction of the center of our galaxy. Now, as far as the planets go, Venus can still be seen low in the northwest after sunset during um, the first part of May, but as the days pass, it will get closer and closer down towards the horizon until it disappears by the end of the third week of the month. Then it will pop back into our morning skies in the eastern part of the sky in the middle of June. Jupiter, Saturn and Mars are the other planets that we can see this month and they're all pretty close together to each other in the sky as well. Jupiter rises over the eastern horizon just before 11pm at the beginning of the month followed by by Saturn less than half an hour later really uh, and then about 90 minutes later by Mars so one after the other they'll pop up over the eastern horizon. Jupiter's big bright and white, Saturn is slightly less bright and it's got a slightly yellowish tinge and Mars is smaller and dimmer uh, but has a sort of an orangey red sort of colour to it. And if you're out and about uh, anywhere between May 12 to May 16, take a look in the late evening hours when the three planets are up above the horizon because as each night passes you'll see the moon passing by each of the planets in turn. The moon as it's moving around the earth in its orbit changes position very very slowly in the sky. You can actually notice it during the course of a night if you take careful notice of which stars it might be next to and then you know a few hours later you'll see it will have moved a little bit but certainly from night to night that is from one night to the next, you will see that it has moved in the sky. So it's going to pass by each of these planets between May 12 to 16 and look really, really nice. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And don't forget, if you're having trouble getting your copy of Australian Sky and Telescope from your usual retailer because of the current lockdown and travel restrictions, you can always get a print or digital subscription have the magazine delivered directly to your letterbox or inbox. And subscribing's easy. Just go to skyandtelescope.com.au. That's skyandtelescope.com.au. And you'll never be left in the dark again. And that's the show for now. 
Space Time is broadcast on Science Zone Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and through both iHeartRadio and on TuneIn Radio. Or you can subscribe and download Space Time as a free podcast through Apple, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, Audio Boom, Podbeam, Android, Castbox, from Space Time with Stuart Gary.com, or from your favorite download podcast provider. You can help support the show and the work we do by visiting the Space Time online shop and grabbing yourself a few goodies, or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to commercial free double episode versions of the show, as well as bonus audio content and other rewards. Just go to our Patreon page through spacetimewithstuartgary.com for all the details. If you want more space time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lower case, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Space Time YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 